Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be. Hi, I'm Rob Dickey, and I'm doing this session at the 2022 Cotesal International Conference entitled Teachers Helping Teachers Teach for a Better World. Of course, that's the conference theme. And my focus is actually focusing on teacher associations. And so let's take a look at what's coming up. First of all, um, just a reminder in case you catch this video some other place, this session is being presented in the Cotesal International Conference Edzilla platform. And this recording is in session 2807. The reason you might want to check that out is because there's a few supplements available there. For example, the references for the paper that will be forthcoming. Okay, so what are we talking about? We're talking about teacher associations, sometimes called teacher societies or language teacher societies. And we're going to talk about the setting for teachers and language teacher societies. And we're going to talk a little bit about the types of teachers and how that could impact the roles of language teacher associations and what teachers can do for or expect from language teacher associations. We're going to take a quick dance through the literature about teacher associations. Uh, then I'm going to introduce the methodology and the analysis for the data collection that I did for this project. And finally, as in most good papers, and if this is a good paper, uh, there will be a discussion of findings, discussions of the process, and finally, some conclusions. I want to open with a thought. If you saw the abstract, you saw that it opened with, no man is an island. Okay, that's sexist. Um, but in many respects, it is true for teachers that they are isolated on an island. Teachers are expected to be the master of their classrooms. And no matter how much you believe in facilitation, the students still have an expectation of the teacher as the leader, as the menu setter for what we're going to do in class. And at the same time, your employer, your fellow teachers, they all may feel like, A, we don't want to meddle in your classroom, and B, maybe you're a professional, you should know. Let's take a look deeper. I need to shrink my face. You don't need to see me so much. All right, so we're talking about various professional and academic societies. Even if we talk about language teacher societies, we can break this down into a lot of different groups. For example, uh, in Korea, we have Korea TESOL, which has traditionally been viewed by many, not necessarily properly, but viewed by many as an expat society. And there are over a half dozen societies that really cater to Korean professors, researchers, classroom teachers in the elementary schools, classroom teachers in the secondary schools, hagwon teachers, although that one's a little arguable. And if we step outside of Korea and go to other countries, we'll find a lot more types of societies. Please note that I wrote professional slash academic. 
I think my mouse has got some yellow highlighting on it. But the, the key point here is that some may see professional as different from academic and different again from what could be called scholarly. So these associations may offer a variety of services and benefits because their members are different, because the expectations are different. They may offer these services to members and or other stakeholders, and we'll talk about that in a couple minutes. Generally, these teacher associations are attempting to respond to demand. Okay? What they think their members want, what they think their prospective members want. But this is limited by organizational resources. For example, finance, where do we get our money, how much money do we have, uh, paid staff, volunteers, what are those volunteers willing to do in terms of time, commitment, and projects. There might be a project that they're happy to do and another project they're not interested in, and that can impact what a society can do or may not do. So, in addition to finance, labor from paid staff, and volunteers, we also have to look at things like time, activity, facilities constraints, and those constraints may be imposed by sponsors. If the government is supporting it, the Ministry of Education is supporting it. That could be a governmental body. It could be some other type of sponsorship. Or it might be that employers, there's quite a few teachers associations around the world that are largely subsidized or supported by teacher employers or schools. So teachers of foreign languages face a lot of different social and professional constraints. And these might be different from other teachers, even from, uh, from other professionals and even other teachers. For example, teachers of English in foreign settings might be very different. And let's just take a look and instead of talking about English, let's talk about teachers of Korean in Vietnam. They may face many of the same issues. And again, we'll get to that in just about one minute. Teachers may feel outcast in their own teaching setting. And again, we're going to look at that in a moment. This is especially true if the foreign language they teach is somehow seen as less legitimate. Uh, some may feel like teaching Japanese in Korea carries a lot of baggage. There's a lot of people who don't like anything associated with Japan. Or somehow the foreign language has been imposed by authorities, such as English is basically required in middle schools, and high schools, and elementary schools. And a lot of universities feel like the government is pushing them to teach English, and, and learners might not like that. This could lead to something like a second-class citizenship where those foreign language teachers are not treated with the same dignity as other teachers. And that could be true of local teachers as well as foreign teachers. That is, uh, the Koreans who are teaching English in Korea may feel that they aren't given the same respect as somebody who teaches math or science. So let's look at what I'm going to propose is a rough typology. Now, we need some more work on this, but let's just take a quick look. Local teachers of a mainstream subject, okay? Your math teacher in the local country who's teaching in the local language. That's our benchmark. That is the base that we will compare all the others to. Second type, local teachers of English serving foreign students with limited English proficiency. Here we're looking at the ESL programs, for example, in the United States high school foreign students. That's a little bit different. Many, most of those folks have teacher licenses, so that would be one thing that makes them a little bit different. Part three is foreign non-native speaker of English ESL teachers inside uh, Brajkatru's inner circle. Here we mean, for example, 
the Korean who got a PhD in applied linguistics in the United States and is now teaching in the English Language Learning Center at ABC University inside the United States. There's a lot of this going on right now. There's a lot of uh, new emerging literature on non-nests. Um, so we've got four and five local teachers of English in a society where English is in common use, the outer circle, let's say Singapore or Philippines. Lo uh, foreign teachers of English in a society where English is a common use. Uh, again, Singapore, Philippines, uh, possibly Malta. Uh, that one's a tough one. Uh, number six, local teachers of English in a society where English is not widely adopted. And that would be the Koreans teaching English in Korea. And type seven is the foreign teachers of English in a society where English is not widely adopted. That would be me teaching in Korea. Okay, so from there, let's talk about the associations. We need to talk about stakeholders. Who are the people who have an investment in language teaching? And many may feel that the Language Teacher Association should have some kind of relationship, that these people are stakeholders in what the Language Teacher Association is doing or should be doing. And the most obvious one are current members. In particular, current paid members. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, we can talk about former members who, for whatever reason, are not current members. We can talk about prospective members, and this might include students. This might include people who have only recently arrived in the country and they were active in a different country and we just need to get them plugged in here. Or it could include people who are new to the profession, all right? Or they're not new to the profession, but they've never been involved in a teacher association. But we feel like uh, they're prospective members. Other stakeholders could include the licensing bodies, uh, government who certifies teachers, uh, employers, educational institutions, pre-service and in-service, uh, master's programs, teacher certificate programs. Renowned scholars in the field may feel like they have some investment, especially if they come to present at a conference. Sponsors and advertisers have some investment in the organization. They put money in, sometimes a lot of money. And finally, the general class of supporters or friends, it's kind of the people who don't fit anywhere else, but we feel like we should be talking about them. So what are members? Well, current members, we need to think about, do these current members have expiring memberships? That is, has their membership actually technically expired, but we never take them off the current membership roles? Does our membership even not have an expiration date? Maybe we don't charge membership dues as a basic membership category. Separate from that are the memberships that other people pay for, but for whatever reason, memberships are at no charge or maybe perceived to be no charge. Now, these three bullets following are not subsections of two. These are three different concepts, but my PowerPoint is full. We need to think about three types of memberships. Voluntary memberships, that's obvious. People who chose to join the organization, they thought it was important, they did all the paperwork, they paid any fees, and they might be proud to say, I'm a member, I've got my membership card. Then we have the involuntary member. These are people who unknowingly or unintentionally became members. And Cotiso had this problem back in the uh, later 1990s where if you came to the conference and paid your conference fee, you were automatically given a one-year membership. Well, if you wanted to be a member or you didn't want to be a member, it was irrelevant you probably might not have known you were getting membership. So it was kind of an involuntary membership. That doesn't mean that it was necessarily bad, you just simply didn't know that you were doing it. And the third type, non-voluntary, is when people are forced to become a member. For example, if you want to present at a conference, the conference management may say, 
you must be a member to present at our conference. And so you pay the fee. Now, whether you are a voluntary, involuntary, or non-voluntary member may impact your perspectives on the organization, your expectations of the member of the organization. But typically, the organizations don't do a good job of recognizing who might fit into each, and that can cause distortions in the sense of our membership. Okay, let's keep going. Along with members, we can talk about tiers of membership with different benefits. Um, you know, we could talk about somebody who only gets uh, the publications, but they're not eligible for a conference discount. We can talk about people who only get a conference discount, but are not eligible for publications. Um, there are various ways of doing this, and that's not the focus of this paper. Uh, the last point here is the duration of membership. Typically, membership is one year, possibly two years, and sometimes they offer a lifetime membership. Hey, I'm a lifetime member of Cotiso. These durations, these different durations, may not actually change the benefits during the term of the paid membership. It might be that if you take a paid membership, it costs you the equivalent of seven years or ten years of membership dues but you could be a member for 25 30 35 years and there are a few people in Cotisol who have been members for over 20 years okay so we need to move on into the literature now the fact is there's not a lot the literature on teacher associations is growing um, much of that literature is very broad uh, about teacher associations. I don't mean each paper is very broad, but I mean there's a little bit about this, a little bit about that, a little bit about this, a little bit about that. Uh, there's not very many efforts to reach more broadly. Um, there are no meta, meta, uh, there's no meta cases I know of, no meta research that's looking at all the various researches, and that might be something to move forward. Um, we can look at a few things. Lindsay Heron did something recently for the Cotiso National Council. Uh, there was a very short version of that in the recent news magazine, TEC, The English Connection. Um, the Jocelyn Wright did something last year at the conference, and it's in the Cotiso Proceedings for 2021. And Tori Thorkelson did something a few years ago for the Korea TESOL Journal. And Tori in particular, Jocelyn also, uh, did a pretty good job of summarizing what else had been done in Cotiso, and Tori also tried to work on what other papers had done in other countries. So, uh, as I mo mentioned before, the references from this paper are on the Edzilla Cotiso conference platform, and you can see a bunch of stuff there. Okay, so how did we do this? I know it's been... Uh, 18 minutes and we haven't got to the depth of this paper. It was a preliminary or pilot study. Why? Because there's so little research done. I can't really say, oh, I'm going to take this model. There's more reading to do to try to find if somewhere, some other teacher's association, maybe not a language teacher association, has done something really well. But one of the concerns is breadth versus depth. As I mentioned, we really want to capture a lot of aspects of language teacher associations. Rather than drilling down too deeply into one specific area that may actually provide us a misguided perception of what's happening. Uh, Gary Moderum has done a few stories, a uh, few studies with IA Tefl. One of his papers is in the references and in that paper he actually refers to an earlier paper. Uh, I did a Facebook poll for roughly 72 hours, that's very small. The Facebook poll we're going to talk about in just one second. And I did an email survey to language teacher associations worldwide, and that is the slide after the next one. So let's look at the Facebook poll. The Facebook poll was offered for about 73 hours exactly, and I put up eight different topics and asked teachers in the Cotisal Facebook 
group to choose the three things they thought were most important from a language teacher association. Now, what we found from that uh, are actually probably three points. One is there's 3,800 participants in the Facebook group, but in 72 hours only about 700 teachers were shown the poll. And out of those 700 teachers shown the poll, only 56 actually answered. So the response rate's abysmally small. Again, uh, that wasn't really the key point here. What was kind of the key point was uh, a trial. And we can see that, for example, I've underlined socialization here. Because when I put that up, I was clearly thinking within my mind, the case of the new foreign teachers in Korea. I was one in 1995 uh, in a relatively small hagwon, and I went to Kotiso looking for other foreign teachers just to kind of feel at home. You know, the cheers idea. We went out for a beer after the meeting, but we had training. So socialization was an aspect. I put up seven ideas, and one other idea was put up in the process of the poll that was vetted work opportunities. So we had 56 respondents and 140 total responses. You can do the math. A few people didn't put three up. They only put one or two. Okay, so that's the Facebook poll. What did we learn? We need to be more careful in our language. The next one, email responses. Well, I have a list of roughly 200 language teachers that I've been working on for several years, sending out various studies. And in this particular case, we only had about 10 days, maybe 12 days, and only eight organizations, nine organizations responded. And you can see on this map. Please don't uh, kill me on this map. It was just a way to kind of see what we can see. By the way, neither Korea TESO nor JALT responded. Um, but, you know, they may get to it later. Sometimes you have to follow up. So those are the organizations that we're in, but most notable, United States, 37 TESOL affiliates are not there. And in Europe, other than Ireland, no respondents. Uh, New Zealand was there, all right. So what were the themes that we pulled out in thematic analysis from those uh, responses to the question to language teacher associations uh, what do you do for teachers and what do teachers do for you I'm not going to read this um, I'm just going to point out that conferences seminars workshop and training regular ELT events um, you can see that there's uh, 7 11 13 responses but when we cluster them together there's seven organizations that indicated this out of the nine Okay, so we had 34 different themes that uh, were reported uniquely. And how teachers uh, support us? The number one was participation and attendance, which is kind of sad that you think, well, is that support? Well, I guess it is in a way. Um, the important one perhaps is membership makes association a stakeholder for other agencies. Uh, that's something that wasn't talked about much anywhere else. Okay, so what are possible LTA activities? Well, this is from a book by Falco and Zete. I, I, I'm sorry, I can't say her name. Um, and it's in the references. It's available online. You can look at it if you want. I did resort it a little bit, uh, but I didn't change it much. So what was the methodology? Again, this was a preliminary or pilot study. And Somehow this got duplicated. All right, we'll just skip that. Last slide, discussions and conclusions. Well, there's lots more work to be done. These pilots indicate a great deal of, fut of further refinements are needed in the data solicitation design. And I admitted that on the Facebook poll. Several people asked about things like socialization. Does that mean like society teaching you how to behave? And my response is basically, well, no, I meant it to be people who go out to look for friendship. And is that networking? Well, possibly, but is professional networking different from just sitting down and having a beer? Uh, you could argue that. Finally, language teacher associations need to seek information from all stakeholder groups, not just current or recent members. 
that's been the weak point of most of the studies we've seen. All right, we probably need to collect some demographics so that we understand these responses. For example, somebody who has a high level of education, somebody who's been in the organization a long time, will have different perspectives than somebody who uh, is a newbie, to use that word. So, I'm at my time, and I'd just like to finish by showing this slide. And thank you very much for your attention. I look forward to hearing from you. Don't be shy to contact me on email. Or, if we go back to that very first slide, you can see uh, the second slide. On There's the Edzilla session where you can find uh, the Discord server connection. All right? Thank you very much. Thank you for joining me.